With NASA poised to return humans to the moon, a crude journey to Mars seeming like an inevitability, and the commercial spaceflight industry picking up speed, many would argue we're entering a new era of human space exploration. This episode, I got to speak to Kelly Girardi, an aerospace expert and suborbital scientist with a wealth of knowledge and experience in the spaceflight industry. She revealed her thoughts on what lies ahead as humanity presses to venture once again beyond Earth orbit. Thank you for having me. I'm Kelly Girardi. Um, I'm coming up on 10 years in the commercial spaceflight industry, which is very exciting. And I've held a lot of different roles in that time. I've worked in policy and media and business development and operations. It's been a wild ride. And then, of course, I've also become a citizen scientist and I've had the opportunity to test spacesuits and conduct NASA-supported research in microgravity as part of a suborbital research group that I hope we get a chance to talk a little bit more about later. But I've also had the privilege to build a really large science communication platform on social media along the way. And that really was a nice dovetail into my first book, which is titled Not Necessarily Rocket Science, A Beginner's Guide to Life in the Space Age, where I really drive home that our next giant leap will require the contributions of artists, engineers, and everyone in between. So I'm very excited for our discussion today. (laughs) Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, quite a, as you said, it's uh, quite a career you've had so far. Um, I suppose it's worth sort of maybe going back to the start. How how did you first get inspired to, how, how did you sort of first realize that space was your thing? Yeah, you know, I'm almost embarrassed to admit at this point that I was not an early blooming space nerd. It it was really late for me. It wasn't until after college that I even learned that there was a commercial spaceflight industry and this growing ecosystem. And at that point, I was very fortunate to run into a couple of folks who were at the ground floor of it themselves, including one private astronaut who really took me under his wing and made some really critical introductions to me in the industry. I met them through the Explorers Club. And from there on, my eyes were opened and I have never been so motivated to be a part of something before. It was just like something clicked and I decided this, this, this is what I want to be involved in. Um, so at, at the moment, you're, you sort of like are providing um, advice and, and, and expertise that, that helps, that helps get, get rockets off the ground and, and, and helps astronauts be safe in space. Is, is that about right? Yeah, a little bit. So, you know, not necessarily rocket science is really sort of descriptive of my career, right? I ended up with a film degree in college, right? Something that is probably the furthest thing you might imagine when you think of the space industry. And and I thought so too. And so I've always had a little bit of imposter syndrome, but with the help of some great mentors and sponsors in the industry, I was really able to create a unique impact in this field and and to grow my contributions. And I think that that non-obvious and non-linear path is something that I wanted to share with folks because people have this idea in their heads of what is the academic background required to be part of the space industry. And from my own experience, I've been able to show that there's not one specific requirement. And so I, I think the genesis of the book really came from thinking about the Renaissance, actually, and reflecting that art was really only one manifestation of this new way of thinking at that time. And cultural innovation was also happening across these really different disciplines of medicine, technology, religion, philosophy, science. And so similarly, I was reflecting that engineering innovation represents just one small slice of the space age, and that actually this is a broader cultural movement, and that the next giant leap will require the contributions of artists and engineers and all of us who fall somewhere in between. Yeah, so do, do you think that um, sort of the, the the developments in um, spaceflight that are yet to come, that sort of o- ordinary people can, can, can play a role? A hundred percent. Look, by the time I finished college, it was like... Uh, you know, painfully clear to me that I had missed my window to become a NASA astronaut. It's like, you know, that path starts a bit earlier in life, <laughs> you know, uh, for for having the highest chance of success, we'll say. Um, there are many outliers who I'm sure could accomplish it at that point, but I was I was not prepared to be one of them. And so I was thinking, how, how could I possibly go myself? And the answer to that is the commercial spaceflight industry. This is the industry through suborbital spaceflight and soon orbital spaceflight for civilians, for academics, for researchers, and yes, for tourists. It's the expansion of Earth's economic sphere and it's the democratization of access to space for regular folks like you and I. And so the ability to rekindle that once really seemingly unrealistic dream of spaceflight was just super exciting. And I think it's something that resonates with a lot of people because once they realize that this is something that could be accessible to them in their lifetimes as a private citizen, you know, it really does unlock some of those early, early dreams of space travel. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you'd mentioned um, space tourism there. Do, do you think that like space tourism is actually something that could could sort of happen for for normal people in inverted commas, not not just kind of billionaires within our lifetimes? I do, I do. I, I think obviously right now in in its most nascent stages, the price is high, right? And as a market grows, as the ROI proves out, as competitors are drawn into the field and helping to drive those prices down, I do think that it becomes something that's accessible. Will it be a luxury in our lifetimes? Yes, I I, I believe it will continue to be a luxury for the next few decades, but hopefully a more accessible luxury in the same way that, you know, perhaps first class flights are for a really special occasion where you you want to make a little bit of a, an extra investment in something that's a special memory for yourself or a family. And so I do think that we're going to get to that point. And I think the fact that we're even able to have it at, at this price point that's under 1 million is already an incredible and extraordinary leap in access. When you think about the fact, just taking a company like Virgin Galactic, for example, when you think about the fact that less than 700 humans in the entire history of our species have ever been to space, and the fact that one single company like Virgin Galactic in their first few years of operation could more than double that number for the entire species, I mean, that that's sort of the scale of amazement that I, I like to take into account when I think about how much of a game changer suborbital spaceflight can be. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I suppose it's, it's probably worth uh, touching on your your experiences with um, the Opossum Project and your your sub- suborbital missions. Um, just to, it'd be interesting just to hear some of the some of the cool missions that you've been on over the over the past few years. Yeah, absolutely. So one of my favorite things to do is, is to do experiments in microgravity. There's really nothing like the sensation of floating in zero g. And I would equate it. If you're wondering what it feels like, it's sort of like. You know, imagine that you're laying flat on your back in a swimming pool, and if you just remove the sensation of water, that's sort of what it feels like. It, it's not that sort of roller coaster, stomach churning sensation that you might imagine. It's actually quite peaceful and calming. But through Project Possum, which originally started as a very specific uh, research goal, it was polar suborbital science in the upper mesosphere. And the intent of this project was to look at that middling layer of our atmosphere, the mesosphere, which is actually not particularly well understood. And there are some of the highest altitude clouds in our atmosphere, noctilucent clouds, are at that level. And um, people believe that they're actually quite sensitive indicators of human-caused climate change, and so they're worth study. But because of where they reside at that highest altitude point in in the atmosphere, it's really hard to get to them and to study them and to observe them. You know, commercial flights are far too low and the space station is orbiting too high, and so suborbital spaceflight is kind of the Goldilocks solution. So Project Possum was born out of the idea that we could have a citizen science mission that was crewed with, with humans on board studying these these really interesting clouds in the mesosphere. The project has spiraled in, in a wonderful way out of that into the field of bioastronautics, and that's where I've really had an amazing opportunity to conduct research, evaluating commercial spacesuits uh, like those from Final Frontier Designs, conducting research with other space agencies. I was able to test a biomonitor um, smart garment before it went up to the station, to the space station. That was from the Canadian uh, Space Agency. And it was just a really exciting way to involve scientists and civilians and researchers in in some of this groundbreaking research. And to do that and to achieve microgravity conditions, uh, we partnered with the Canadian National Research Council and their Falcon 20 aircraft. And that aircraft flies in a parabolic arc up and down. And on those nosedives, you get these precious seconds of microgravity uh, to conduct the research. And so we just did parabola after parabola. Uh, And so I've done multiple flight campaigns with them and I I really enjoy it. I, I can't speak um, highly enough about it. Um, I, I mean, when you consider that um, what, one of the big challenges um, for human spaceflight is this idea of you know astronauts spending uh, you know up to a year in the International Space Station, um, or you know for however long it would take to get to Mars and back, how how can those sort of short, intense moments in zero gravity actually help with with our our kind of collective knowledge and in, in terms of making making space flights safe for humans? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the 
biggest area of research that I've really loved to be involved in is a, um, suborbital space suit evaluation. So, you know, thinking of these suits are, are intended actually for IVAs instead of EVAs, EVAs being outside of the vehicle, extravehicular activity, spacewalks, IVAs being inside, you know, what happens in an event of rapid depressurization? Well, you've got a pressure suit on. And so there is a, a big gap in the industry that I I think soon with the advent of really regular, consistent suborbital spaceflight that we'll be able to continue to advance safety and precaution. And I do think suborbital spacesuits are going to be, um, you know, a really interesting addition to the market. So being able to evaluate them and from my side, you know, dexterity is something trying to do any task in a gloved (laughs) spacesuit is really difficult, you know, from, from the fine motor skills, like trying to, you know, manipulate a payload. so something easy like Velcroing something to the side of your seat, it, it is a little more clumsy in a spacesuit. And so it really becomes necessary to advance the dexterity and the ease of movement of something like a spacesuit glove and wrist turn and all of these little elements that um, go overlooked but become critically important when you're trying to manipulate a small piece while everything around you is moving. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's one of the things I've I've always thought about the sort of um, suits that astronauts wear for for EVAs when they're when they're, when they're on a spacewalk is um, especially like the uh, the helmet um, because you know you, you hear stories of I think it was was it was it Luca Parmitano um, his space helmet started filling up with sweat yeah. with, or with water with with the cooling water and it's just it's absolutely horrendous when you think about that. Absolutely. No, it, it, it's scary. And, you know, you think about someone like him who's so trained to remain calm in a situation of emergency like that and, and to proceed with such a level head, it really is a testament to the rigorous training that, that goes into preparedness for situations like that. But you're absolutely right. I mean, these are the things that can be evaluated on the ground. These are the types of of research that can be conducted in a safe, simulated environment to try to understand the behaviors of when when a component of a suit fails, how does it fail? What does that look like? How can we build in, you know, extra precautions, redundancy? How can we account for some of this abnormal behavior that pops up, whether it's condensation or just figuring out comfort. You know, you get an itch in the back of your ear. What do you do? (laughs) You can't reach it. And so just understanding sort of how the entire system integrates with a human test subject. And it can range from, you know, the actual mechanics of the suit to something equally important, in my view, as comfort. Mm. Yeah. And I suppose it becomes even more um, significant when you think about sort of ambitions to have a more permanent settlement on on the on the moon, or to, or to get um, humans to Mars. Um, the ISS is, is is relatively speaking quite quite close by, so so a rescue is easy. But I mean, if if you had to, if someone got really got into trouble on the moon, it takes ages to get there. Yeah, and that, and that's why you know cross training of crews is so important, and we you know once one of the other analog environments that I had the absolute privilege to be a part of was a long duration simulated mission to Mars as part of a crew member on at the Mars Desert Research Station. And it was a fascinating opportunity to think about the fact that, you know, you think about the earliest astronauts and what was the right profile for something like that, this like high octane orbit of the Earth. And you think, okay, yeah, it makes sense. The steely eyed test pilot, right? Like that tracks, makes sense. But then when you think about who is the ideal candidate to make a home out of Mars, you know, it's it's different. It's a different profile. We're talking about different needs and, and a different experience. And so as spaceflight evolves, it really dawned on me that crew needs and ideal candidate profiles are going to evolve alongside them. And, you know, that that opens the, you know, most fascinating can of worms when you think about, you know, thinking carefully about like value systems that you want to export to a new world. And, you know, the qualifications being looked at through this more scrutinized lens of compatibility and partnership and personal values, emotional fortitude, all of these things that are just really interesting to look at in in sort of the pressure cooker that can be a simulated mission to Mars. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably not the only person who's noticed that astronauts are generally really, really nice people. And I, I, I guess, I guess that I mean, you know, that must be a prerequisite because you couldn't have someone who was really grumpy or really boring. You know, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think you know the no asshole rule really applies. It's like you know, who who wants to be stuck with someone like that for a long duration? You know, in a, in a small space, absolutely. But I do think it, it raises like a really interesting point, and I could be in the minority here. But I even think Mars 
crews are, are still quite short term thinking when we look at you know, qualifications for, for astronauts, because if we're aiming to survive as a species in the long term, then small elite groups of handpicked and highly selected astronauts aren't going to get us there in the long run. No matter how diverse the crews are, we, we have to approach the problem with a really more universal goal in mind. And in my mind, that's democratizing access to space for humans of all backgrounds and abilities, especially regular people like you and me. And we need that data validation. You know, you look at highly trained crews and you see a pretty homogenous medical history. You see very similar sort of, you know, heart rates, BMIs, you know, all all of these things, because, you know, rightfully space travel, as you've mentioned, is something that, you know, you have to make sure that they're safe. That's paramount. But as we have the opportunity to unlock access for regular civilians like you and I through suborbital spaceflight, where it's not a long duration stay, where help is not available to them, it's more of a, a single day event and flight, That really allows us to collect an enormous wealth of data about how different people tolerate spaceflight pressures differently. And so I I think it's quite exciting and a step in the right direction. Mm, Yeah, that's a really, really good point. I mean, I I think one of the also one of the things that um, people are really looking ahead to, especially in in the States, is this um, the development of the uh, commercial crew program. And I was wondering to get your your thoughts on that. Are are you you excited about about what SpaceX and, and Boeing are doing with NASA? It's amazing. And I wish this wasn't audio only so that you can see my hands and gesticulations because I am just so excited about how far we've come in the last decade. You know, this has been in the works for a long time and NASA has been such a proactive partner in enabling this ecosystem to grow and rightfully fostering the capability of private industry to partner with public government you know, to unlock access to low Earth orbit and to continue to save money and rightfully prioritize funds elsewhere where there's not a clear ROI um, for exploration. And so this is a huge testament. It's an incredible thing to accomplish, both for SpaceX and Boeing. And, and, you know, looking at some of these SpaceX flights, it's just extraordinary that they have been able to accomplish what previously only nation states have. I mean, we're, this is a single company that is able to do this. It's quite remarkable. And, uh, you know, when we, I, one of my buzzword phrases I keep saying is the democratization of access to space. But this is exactly what that looks like. SpaceX and now Boeing are really proving that out. And it's it's extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, I was um, relatively recently, I was I was interviewing um, the, the former NASA astronaut, uh, Terry Vertz, and we were talking about that. And he, he was joking, obviously, but he said, you know, the, the, the problem is that in America, every four years, we have elections. You know? um, exactly. So you, you, you could see funding being really good for, for one administration and then the funding's cut for the other, other administration. Whereas with, I suppose with a private company, they, they've just got one goal in mind. Yeah, and I, I think it's it works in our favor. I think it's actually like quite a healthy setup to have because he's absolutely right. You know, trying to conduct science and long duration scientific investments on four-year administration cycles is painful for everyone and, and really does compromise the the outcome. And I think, you know, the ability, the, the wonderful marriage here is sort of the institutional knowledge of a NASA and the deep expertise that they hold in this space married with the tempo of a Silicon Valley, right? It, it's like, you know, they, they're able to innovate. They're very quick. They're agile. And so combining those two gives us the best possible world where we, obviously, safety remains paramount and you, you're able to draw on this deep expertise and knowledge sharing, but you're able to accelerate the progress and the tempo and you're able to do those together in a way that, you know, has a little bit of a buffer from some of the political, you know, turmoil that exists at the funding level. Yeah, I was. I was also wanting to get your your thoughts on um, the commercial crew program in terms of it it returning uh, American launches to to America. Um, you know, it, it, what because obviously um, uh, since the retirement of the space shuttle, Americans have been using the Russian Soyuz and launching from Kazakhstan. But, but well, what does it mean to to you as an American to you know for the, the commercial crew? Yeah, it it was amazing. I I cried on Crew One launch watching it, and I was so fortunate to be in Florida at that time. I was actually able to see it from my backyard, um, and it was it was just extraordinary. I grabbed my three year old's daughter, and we watched it first launching on our TV screen, and then we ran outside to just see it soar through the air. It was, it was incredible. But you know, the spectacle of human spaceflight is something that really 
it's hard to replicate when when it's not sort of happening here in the country. You know, we have had consistent presence on the space station. We've had that since 2002. No one born after 2002 has, you know, lived in a time where there haven't been humans living and working in space around the clock consistently. I mean, that, that's extraordinary that, you know, anyone who's born after that date has just never known a time when that hasn't happened. But I think it's it's so far removed. You know, the act just watching them walk down, you know, the runway, get in their cars, say goodbye to their families. You know, that spectacle and the the emotional aspect of it. One, it's really hard to duplicate with robotic spacecraft, even though we've had some extraordinary launches from U.S. soil. Obviously, it, the human element, the the explorer in in the mix, I think, is really something that taps into something special with people. So to restore access to orbit from U.S. soil has been a very, I think, emotional uh, achievement for, for a lot of folks and really exciting. I think it tees us up for uh, renewed public interest in space exploration and, and you know, literal uh, skin in the game in terms of thinking about what we're doing, why we're doing, and, you know, where we're going from here. Um, is there a, is there a worry that you'll sort of lose that, that sort of element of collaboration with, with Russia, which is sort of been really blossomed since since the Cold War and then since since the, since the space race? I don't think so. I think we're going to gain a, a, an even broader aperture of international collaboration. You know, the fact that we have more opportunities for these cosmic ride shares now, you know, other nation states, perhaps ones who've never had an astronaut ambassador from their country, now have even more options to send one. I think, you know, that sort of opening of access and, you know, removal of further barriers is going to allow a lot of new emissaries, you know, to make their first space flight. We're going to see nations um, who have never previously, and some who don't have space agencies of their own, still able to send astronaut representatives or scientists to conduct research. And with Russia in particular, you know, that is still a very strong relationship on the International Space Station. That partnership is is deep. Uh, you know, the the official language is Runglish, <laughs> you know, this nice <laughs> mix of Russian and English that continues um, to, to deepen. And so I, I think that that relationship will continue to blossom on station. And the fact that we have more options for reaching the station, I think, is only an asset to international collaboration opportunities. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've already spoken about sort of um, human settlement on, on Mars. I just want to get your, your thoughts on the sort of um, plans to have a permanent settle- settlement on the moon? I mean, how do you, how, how, how do you feel about that? I, I feel pretty strongly about, you know, settlement in general. I do think it's important for us to invest in the capabilities to sustain off Earth. And I think, you know, the moon is, is a really great candidate for that, both in proximity and also as a sandbox and proving ground for even further destinations. And so I think there's, there's a lot of... Uh, a value to both, right? You know, Mars, it, it almost seems embarrassing at this point that we haven't been there yet. You know, <laughs> you, you look at the past 50 years of, of incredible achievements in, in space. And, you know, I, I do understand where people are coming from when they lament the fact that we haven't been back out of low Earth orbit since. And, you know, there is this generation that sort of identifies as the orphans of Apollo, mm. you know, because we had this big cultural global achievement. And then, you know, we stayed a little bit closer to home and did incredible things there. And we continue to do incredible things robotically f- much further out. But I, I do think Mars is calling. It's on the horizon, you know, and the moon, I, I'm equally happy to see these investments happen. You know, I'm, I'm location agnostic <laughs> when it comes to the settlement. I, you know, the moon, if that's where we're going, I'll take it. And I'm very excited personally about the Artemis program. I'm, I'm thrilled that, you know, we are explicitly prioritizing putting the first female and the next man on the moon. I, I think that's going to be an extraordinary achievement and something I, I'm very personally looking forward to watching. Do you worry about, um, you know, sort of the potential downside of all this? So, for example, something like, I suppose you know, people might use words like um, colonization or something like, you know, private companies. Like you might, you know, might eventually see like a massive sort of Coca-Cola billboard on the moon or, you know, things like that. Those kind of common common concerns that people have. Yeah. So, you know, I, I have a little bit of a more nuanced sort of view on commercialization. I, I think you know, the expansion of Earth's economic sphere is critically important. It's hand in hand with the democratization of access to space and 
look, exploration needs both patrons and pioneers. You need both to do it. You look at the first summit of Mount Everest, Ernest Shackleton, funded by documentary rights. And so, you know, our entire history of exploration has come with this backbone of funding, you know, and and, and I think that's an important component that we, we should be thoughtful about, absolutely. But we shouldn't shy away from. I, I think it's it's wonderful when I look at some of the companies who are really leaning in um, to like Estee Lauder, who is going to send one of their products to the space station, one of their night serums, and to really participate and be kind of at the vanguard of, of this new opportunity to conduct commercial uh, operations in space. I think that's really exciting. But I will say there are things that I worry about that the space industry needs to prepare themselves to grapple with. I think 2020 in particular this year has sharpened the lens for a lot of folks. And the reality is that the contrast and the emotional dissonance between exhilarating space achievements and devastating earthly happenings is only going to grow as the decade unfolds and as the next few decades unfold. You know, many of us in the industry know that space is critical But we need to start preparing the public to grapple with that dissonance. But we also need to hold ourselves accountable for being agents of change. You know, the the space industry has to realize that it can never exist independent of what's happening on Earth. Space exploration is people. People are Earthlings. It's all intertwined. And so I think we, we need to be good stewards of that relationship. And, you know, we can care about multiple things at once. And I don't believe that space exploration is mutually exclusive to earthly investment, but I do think we need to do a better job of communicating that to the public as an industry. It's interesting that you're kind of looking back on 2020 because it was, it was quite a year, wasn't it? I mean, it was interest, I would be interested to see your your thoughts on 2021, what, what lies ahead, and also what, what you personally will be doing. You know, your, your books out and um, you've obviously probably got a a packed 12 months ahead? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So right now I'm really looking forward, one, to a vaccine globally. (laughs) That's sort of paramount to where my head's at Um, and unpausing some some travel and, and work. But I think later in the year, I do hope that once it's safe to do so, to resume some of our research goals, I'll be back hopefully, flying in in microgravity, conducting some new research. I'm, I'm really excited for that. Um, you know, and as the industry continues to unfold, just helping to amplify some of the exciting narratives that are taking place. I think there are a lot of things that we can look forward to. And I think there's a lot of things that people don't realize. You know, the planet that NASA studies most is Earth. And so there is a lot of inward looking equal to the outward looking in the universe. And one of my goals after this year and coming off the heels of 2020 is to really showcase that. I I would love to amplify some of those stories to show how investment in space is also investment in Earth and ourselves. I I, I suppose you also would have potentially been been doing a bit of a book tour as well. was, Was that all kind of put on hold? Yeah, you know, it's so funny. I have, you know, I know this is a podcast only, so you can't see, but I have cardboard cutouts of myself that were (laughs) ordered pre-COVID that were designed to be a part of this bookstore for various bookstores. And so now I have this army of Kellys just kind of standing with me here in my home office, which, you know, I'm not mad about. I I love it. But uh, yeah, you know, it was an interesting experience as a first-time author planning for this sort of um, very different in-person experience and then scaling that back really quickly. So I've been thrilled to get to be a partner virtually to a lot of um, different institutions. And in fact, I think I'm probably reaching more people uh, in aggregate than I would have if I were doing small in-person events. You know, I'm able to now go anywhere in the country virtually. And so I have some great things coming up um, here in the U.S. with the Exploratorium and different science museums and and different children's programs. And so I'm really thrilled about that opportunity. You know, lemonade out of the lemons. Cool. Well, I hope you get to use your your army of Kellys next year. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, thanks thanks very much for speaking to me today, Kelly. It's been been brilliant. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm.